morning, everyone. Let's get on with the reading of the Word and find out a little more about Apostle Paul. Well, today we're in 1 Corinthians 15 still, and the Apostle Paul is still berating the Corinthians over this business of resurrection as if it weren't real. But here's where he begins in verse 29. He says, Else what shall those be doing who are baptizing? In other words, if resurrection, just to catch you back up, if resurrection isn't happening, then what in the world are those people going to be doing who are baptizing? It's for the sake of the dead, absolutely, if the dead are not being roused. Why are they baptizing also for their sake? Why are we also in danger every hour? Verse 31, daily am I dying. By this boast of yours, brethren, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, if as a man I fight wild beasts in Ephesus, what is the benefit to me? If the dead are not being roused, quote, we may be eating and drinking, for tomorrow we are dying. In other words, there's just no point in anything we're doing, and certainly no point in the dangers we face, or the sacrifices we make on your behalf. He's, this is, I'm talking for Paul here. If the dead are not raised, then this whole effort is a farce and we ought to just go to the nearest bar and have a gay old time. Be not deceived, he says in verse 33. Listen to this. Be not deceived. Evil conversations are corrupting kind characters. Sober up justly and do not be sinning. For some have an ignorance of God. To abash you or to embarrass you, am I saying this? This section that I just read seems kind of an odd interjection until you remember that Paul started down this road because some were saying that resurrection does not or will not happen. There must have been a lot of conversations had on this subject amongst the Ecclesia and it is these conversations I believe that prompted Paul to deliberately embarrass the Corinthians for entertaining those conversations. Be not deceived, evil conversations are corrupting kind characters, that's verse 33, and then verse 34, sober up justly and do not be sinning, for some have an ignorance of God. To abash you am I saying it. Paul goes on in verse 35, but someone will be protesting. How are the dead being roused? Now with what body are they coming? These questions frustrated Paul, as you'll see, because the ones asking them haven't understood what he's been saying to them prior to all of this. Imprudent one, he says in verse 36, what you are sowing is not being vivified if it should not be dying. In other words, you can't be made alive if you haven't already died. He continues in verse 37, you are not sowing to the body which shall come to be, but a naked kernel, perchance of wheat or some of the rest. Yet God is giving it a body according as he wills, and to each of the seeds its own body. Everything you do today benefits or harms the body you're in today, not the body that's coming. This is the body that is dying. The one that we're living in right now is the body that is dying and will die. The Father has provided this body and the one to come, and nothing you can do today can prepare for the body that is to come. Not all flesh is the same flesh, he says in verse 39. But there is one indeed of men, yet another flesh of beasts, yet another flesh of flyers, yet another of fishes. There are bodies celestial as well as bodies terrestrial, that means earthly, but a different glory indeed is that of the celestial, yet a different that of the terrestrial. Another glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for star is excelling star in glory. Thus also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is roused in incorruption. Listen to this. It is sown in dishonor. It is roused in glory. It is sown in infirmity. It is roused in power. It is sown a soulish body. It is roused a spiritual body. If there is a soulish body, there is a spiritual also. Thus it is written also, the first man, Adam, quote, became a living soul the last Adam, a vivifying spirit. But not first the spiritual, this is verse 46, but the soulish, thereupon the spiritual. Here we get a picture of the body we're in right now. It is soulish, meaning mortal. 
If you've ever heard of the idea of an immortal soul, you can easily see here that no such notion is found in the scriptures, not here or anywhere else. The soulish body is the one that dies. And when it dies, the soul, your awareness, dies with it. Isn't that interesting? Verse 46, when he's saying, but not first the spiritual, but the soulish, S-O-U-L. Yes. Thereupon the spiritual. And then he speaks of the first man was out of the earth, soilish. It is interesting. Paul is about to change, as Barbara just said, he's about to change his description from soulish, which I just read, to soilish. Listen to this. The first man was out of the earth, soilish. The second man is the Lord out of heaven. Such as the soilish one is, such are those also who are soilish. Made from the earth, that's it. And such as the celestial one, he's talking about Christ now here, such are those also who are celestials. And according as we wear the image of the soilish, we should be wearing the image also of the celestial. And in a sense, Paul says in verse 48, we're all like Adam in that we all came from dirt. We'll also be the same as Christ, the celestial one he talks about, made from spirit. Just as surely as we wear these soilish bodies, we'll also wear the celestial spiritual bodies. Verse 50, now this I am a varying brethren and sisteren, that flesh and blood is not able to enjoy an allotment in the kingdom of God. Neither is corruption enjoying the allotment of incorruption. Lo, a secret to you am I telling. This is verse 51, circle this. When Paul ever says, a secret to you I'm telling, listen up. We all indeed shall not be put to repose. We're not all going to die, yet we all shall be changed. In an instant in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trump. For he will be trumpeting, and the dead will be roused incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal put on immortality. Now, whenever this corruptible should be putting on incorruption, and this mortal should be putting on immortality, then shall come to pass the word which is written, Swallowed up was death by victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Now the sting of death is sin, yet the power of sin is the law. Let me finish this, verse 57. Now thanks be to God who is giving us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Somewhere else in his writings, we'll get to it. He makes a statement similar to this. I'm not quoting verbatim here, but he says, we are sinning because we are dying. Listen to this. We are not dying because we are sinning. Let me say it again. We are sinning because we are dying. Why do you think we can't avoid it? Let me speak for myself. Why do you think I can't avoid it? But sinning is not even an issue. It has no power without the law. The law really only served to highlight the sin that was already there. And that's what he's talking about, the power of sin. Because with the law, you can now see it (laughs) in bold relief. Because the law is full of, you know, do this and certainly don't do that. But if you think we're dying because we sin, it's the other way around. Dying is part of being human in this wicked eon. And Adam started it. So this allotment that we share with all who believe in Yeshua, this is is the spiritual body that he's talking about. It's our immortal, incorruptible bodies upon his return. That's when death loses its sting and sin ends. And verse 57 is another one you ought to circle in your Bible. Now thanks be to God who is giving us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And let's move on to verse 58. So that my beloved brethren and sisteren become settled, unmovable, superabounding in the work of the Lord always, being aware that your toil is not for nothing, not for naught in the Lord. Now here's a question. What is the work of the Lord that Paul talks about here? Or you could say the Lord's work. Is it becoming a minister, a pastor? Is it serving wherever you attend church if you do? Is it helping out in homeless shelters, soup kitchens, food pantries? Is it visiting the elderly or the sick? What is the Lord's work? 
I didn't really know the answer until Barbara reminded me about something we read before in 1 Corinthians 12.4, where Paul wrote, Now there are apportionments of graces, yet the same Spirit. And there are apportionments of services and the same Lord. And there are apportionments of operations, yet the same God who is operating all in all. Now to each one is being given the manifestation of the Spirit. Listen to that. The manifestation of the Spirit. Not just any manifestation. The manifestation with a view to expedience. He's talking about tongues there. For to one indeed through the Spirit is being given the word of wisdom, yet to another word of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, yet to another faith by the same Spirit, yet to another the graces of healing by the same Spirit, yet to another operations of powerful deeds, yet to another prophecy, yet to another discrimination of spirits, yet to another species of languages, yet to another translation of languages, now all these, one and the same Spirit is operating, apportioning to each his own according as he is intending. For even as the body is one and has many members, yet all the members of the one body, being many, are one body, thus also is the Christ. In other words, as Barbara reminded me, the work of the Lord is what you're called to do. What are you given to do? By the graces of the Spirit, or the apportionments. I should say, of the Spirit. So the next questions are, what are you called to do and how do you know? Well, for me, it boils down to what you can't stop thinking about, what you can't shake. It's like if you don't get on with whatever this is running in your head all the time, life just doesn't feel right. It isn't right. How would you say that is, Barbara, for you? How did you recognize a calling? I think when people in my store, after I was healed of muscular dystrophy, and the first woman who came in after that was this Arkansas sportscaster's wife, who was crippled of multiple sclerosis. She was 35, crippled up, her arms frozen. And I said, do you want me to pray for you? God will heal you. And she looked at me like, don't mess with me. And I said, no, seriously, look at me. I'm healed of muscular, look, God did it. And so she said, oh, yeah, sure, like blowing me off, but yeah, give it your best shot. Well, I prayed for her, and she was totally healed, started moving her arms around and all that. <laughs> this was like within the week after I was healed of muscular dystrophy. And I said, finally, God just kept it, because now I'm hearing God. And he said, pray for her, Barbara. It's like, God, I'm not sure this stuff works. Pray for her, Barbara. God, I'm not sure this stuff works. I'm sure not sure it works through me. Pray for her, Barbara. God, the store's full of people. The phone's ringing out the wall. Please. He wasn't going to quit. And so I just went over and said, Becky, God said I have to pray for you. I had no idea. I hadn't prayed for people like that. You know, in the Baptist church, I'm sorry, but we just, y'all pray for you. Yeah, you never did. Some people did. The real Christians might have. I don't know. Or the super Christians. But when I prayed for her, she cried and left. And it's like, thank God I'll never have to do that again. Surely that's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. But when she came back six months later and said, I just have to tell you what happened to me six months ago, she said, I've been a closet alcoholic, and she did that with drugs. Yeah, she did pills. She, she pills. drank and did pills. Right. She said, I've been to every drug and alcohol rehab center. Nothing worked. I had written my suicide note, but I had to come get Robin. That's her daughter a pair of Reeboks first. She said, but when you prayed for me, my life totally changed and I didn't need, I was totally delivered of all that and I get to live. The third was, oh, that woman who was like dying. She had, she was a young lady. She had like a week to live and somebody brought her to the store. And it was an interesting journey, but that girl lived and it was a miracle. And then a couple came in that I wound up ministering at their church. So all these doors started opening, and I realized, oh, I need to go do this. And I started crying out to God for 18 months. God, I want to go do the stuff. I want to go do the stuff Jesus did. Heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out devils and set the captives free. Jesus said we could do everything he did and more. It's like, good, it's happening around here. 
So you realize that God was opening doors and that's how you came to the conclusion that this was what you were supposed to do. This well, I had your... to go do it. He wasn't sending enough people to the store. I didn't want to be there anymore. <laughs> I just wanted to go do the stuff. And so when the day after I prayed that for 18 months, just crying out to God, I had no idea what that sentence meant. That's just, a, God, please set me free to owe no man anything but the love of Jesus Christ and free to kick the dust off my feet when it's not received. 18 months later, he said, go. It's like, but God, you gave me this big house on the lake with the pool and the spa, everything money could buy. And he said, read the book again. The rich young ruler was to take nothing with him. I said, go. So once you step into the call that now has become blatantly obvious, then God continues to direct your steps in the direction he's already determined. Yep. But it seems like to me. Yeah. Learn a lot about faith because I never thought about that. I never thought about the consequences of my prayer. I never thought how God would do that. I never thought that I'd get down to nothing <laughs> being in the welfare line. You know, I never thought where that prayer would lead, but I didn't care. Right. I just couldn't stay in the stores with four stores and ten on the drawing board. I just couldn't do that anymore. You didn't stop to think what that prayer would lead, but the only reason you had that prayer is because you couldn't shake the reason for that prayer. You wanted to go do the stuff, and he wasn't sending enough people to the store. <laughs> and then the last time I went to market, and I just left, which I always loved market coming to market in Dallas, and I just left. It's like, this place is hell. I don't care about how many sizes and how much money and what the color of the year is. I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I left. That's the other thing that happens that whatever you've been doing it just leaves a bad taste in your mouth all the time. When the grace of God departs, you better be with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember when I was in the chiropractic office back in 1990, and it was like a vision of God just reaching down and grabbing me by the collar and saying, this is what you're going to do next. And when I got up off that table, all I, I said, what do I have to do to do this? Not because I felt like I had to. I couldn't wait. You know, how fast can I leave the stores, you might have said. And I had the same thing. It's like, how quickly? What do I have to do to learn this? Is there a way I could start tomorrow? I'll learn absolutely everything I promise. And I had no idea what all that was going to cost, but I didn't care either. When we were listening to the guy who came through Denver, Colorado, somewhere during that weekend, I knew I had to get to Topeka and study with these people. I want to know this. I want to understand this, which was a lot like what I prayed the day after I was baptized with the Spirit. Father, I just want to know you, and I want to know what's true, and I don't care what that costs. Because within a month of that, or less, I met the guy coming through who was studying in Topeka with this group, and he'd lost the church over it. He came up to me. I didn't come up to him. But he came up to me, and he, he looked me square in the eye, and he said, I encourage you to come to Topeka and study with us, and I encourage you to go to the university there. Mm -hmm. And that was the confirmation I was looking for, to see if there was some way I could know for sure. I knew that's what I wanted to do, but is it the direction I should take? And it wasn't a month and a half after that that we were in Topeka studying. I couldn't get away from this stuff, is my point here. When you know we were talking about the calling, or the work of the Lord is how this all started. Going to Topeka from Denver was my work of the Lord and also getting over my total resistance to going back to school, back to the university. <laughs> Bottom line is, you'll know if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing because you can't help yourself. You have to get on with it. None of this is hard. The Father is operating the purpose of the eons according to the counsel of His will. You are part of His will, an important part. He intends for you to be where you are today. So if you can't shake a train of thought or you can't stop thinking about a direction to take, 
you may be staring your calling, your work of the Lord, right in the face. So ask him, am I doing what you have called me to do? Is this my work of the Lord? And if you don't hear anything, you're already doing it. But if you do hear something, and if you know in your heart you really want, almost need to be doing something else, then start finding out how to go about doing that. And until next time, may Yehovah bless you and keep you. May Yehovah light up his face toward you and be gracious to you. May Yehovah lift his face to you and appoint peace for you. Amen.